Buenas tardes a todos. Eh, tengo hoy el, el grandísimo honor de presentar. For me, it's a great honor to be able to introduce you here in Casa Abre to um, an artist here. We're holding a, an excellent exhibition of his work. I've been so surprised by the, the quality, the caliber of the work and the beauty of the work. Uh, this is an artist who isn't very well known in Spain, very regrettably. And uh, one of the missions that we have set out for ourselves in Casa Arabe is to try to, to take culture and art in particular from our countries closer to the general public here in Spain. He is an ingenious uh, artist, uh, Chant Avedisian. There are many like him. Quite often this is because uh, the media doesn't always pick up uh, on these artists uh, in their own countries, such as they might do if they lived in Europe or the US or elsewhere. But here, this evening, you yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, will be able to see the caliber of his work here. He is a prestigious um, artist. He's traveled all over the world. And you will be able to to see uh, that uh, he has uh, exhibited his work uh, all over the world. He's a very well-known artist in Egypt and outside of Egypt, who perhaps he isn't yet as well-known as he should be in Spain. Nigel Ryan is going to be talking to us this evening about the artist. Uh, he, uh, of course, uh, knows the artist and his work very well. Uh, he uh, also knows Egypt very well. He's been living there since 1989. He is one of the top experts uh, today in contemporary Egyptian art. Uh, and uh, I would say the contemporary artistic scene in Egypt. He's going to be talking to us this evening about uh, Chant Avedisian. Uh, as I say, he actually... Uh, has a uh, nose chant. Uh, I believe uh, they've been friends uh, from a lot for a long time. Then we'll be able to hold uh, a discussion. Sa Sabrina Amrani will join us in that discussion. You perhaps uh, already know that there is a gallery under the name of Sabrina Amrani here in Madrid. Uh, it's her gallery. Uh, it was opened back in 2011. It was Sabrina Amrani who brought Chant Avedisian to Madrid, and, she, and Sabrina Amrani is the person uh, who we have to thank for giving us the chance to have this exhibition here this evening. Sabrina Amrani, as I said, has been running the gallery since 2011, brings uh, works of art from all different uh, artists uh, from different countries of origin, but particularly from Eastern countries. And I think it um, is more and more necessary for us to, to see artists from Eastern countries here in Madrid, because I believe that we're very much focused on uh, works from this uh, area and are not opening up our, our vision to those uh, countries outside. This exhibition, then, of Chantavis Avedistian, uh, is the very first uh, exhibition of his work to be held here. It's a retrospective, and as I was saying, uh, this is all part uh, of uh, our a wish uh, to bring uh, the work of artists uh, like Chan closer to the general public and to really delve more into his uh, art. Uh, that is all I want to say at this point. I'm going to uh, give the floor to the speakers this evening to talk to you about the artist and his work. And let me give the floor, first of all, to Nigel Ryan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it would always be a great pleasure to be at Casa Rabe and to be in Madrid, but, um, but I'm particularly happy to be here on this occasion, which is the first major showing of works by Chant Avedisian in Spain. Um, Chant, I suspect, is, um, is a member of that growing band of artists whose name is probably more familiar than his work. Um, I think that this is the case, speaks volumes about, about what's deemed newsworthy in all culture and how, how that news is processed. So if you type in Chant's name, in, type his name into any search engine, and the chances are that at the top of the results will be the news that in 2013 he broke auction records at Sotheby's. I mean, if you, if you then click on images, um, what you'll see is a selection from the series of works that broke those records. You'll see intensely stylized portraits of Am Kalsum. 
you'll see a host of singers and actors and actresses from, from the golden age of Egypt's cinema. You'll see these saturated and very glittering portraits. I mean, literally so, because of... Um, Oh, can I? Is this not? <coughs> is that better? <laughs> is that better? Yeah, yeah, okay. Should I? Um, do you want me to start again? No, no, no okay. No. Okay. So what you'll see are these very glittering portraits, um, literally so, because, of, because he uses so much gold paint in them, um, of a very glitzy crowd. What... What you won't get is any suggestion that um, these are these are a very um, they're they're very atypical that they're a very limited part of, of of the series from which they've been drawn, and that they're an even less representative sample of of, of Chant's work as a whole. So I think one reason why the current show here is important is that it offers an antidote to that kind of lopsided representation. Um, it's an antidote to the view that, that Chant Avedicine is somehow um, the purveyor of nostalgia for some glamorous but now lost age. Um, of, course, no, um, of course, no art is produced in a vacuum. Um, neither is it particularly useful, um, whatever attempts we make to kind of impose a cordon sanitaire or to sterilize the venues in which it's displayed. Neither is it kind of particularly useful to kind of view art in a vacuum. So what I'd like to do is to sketch out, I mean, not at any great length, but I hope efficiently, is to sketch out a context for, um, for the works that you'll see. Um, Chant Avedisian. Um, here we, here's a self-portrait of the artist by the Great Wall of China, which I think is a telling backdrop, given it's one of the, you know, the most concrete, dramatic, dramatic concretizations of the kind of borders that I'm going to argue Chant's work seeks to surmount. Um, Chant was born in Cairo, Egypt, in 1951, and I think the name and the place and the date, they're all very important. Avedisian, of course, is not an Arabic name. Um, he's Armenian, though he was born in Cairo. And he was born in 1951. Um, that's a year before um, King Farouk, who's here. This is, um, this is a portrait um, titled um, Mahaboud al Shab, I think. Um, um, icon, idol, idol of the people, I think, would be a the best translation. He was born a year before King Farouk was deposed in the 1952 revolution um, by a group of army officers um, led by Gamal Abdel Nasser. Here's, um, here's Nasser. The images behind, they're all monotypes. They're part of the, the, um, they're part of the Cairo stencil series that, that Chant began working on in 1991. Um, this one of Nasser is simply entitled, it's titled Al Rais, the president. Um, that's the position Nasser assumed in, in 1956 after um, conveniently placing his predecessor, um, Mohammed Naguib, under house arrest. Um, Shant's made many images of Nasser. He's made more than a few of King Farouk. I mean, the background of this particular image contains both the eagle of Saladin. Um, which was introduced as a symbol of the revolution in 1952, and it still occupies um, the central band of the Egyptian flag. So there's the Eagle of Saladin, together with a very simplified map of the. It is the right, yeah, it's the right one. A very simplified map of the Arab world, a, a very, very clear reference um, to the pan-Arabism that Nasser would espouse. Now, Chant grew up during the heyday of Nasserist pan-Arabism. Um, here is the Arab world, another of the stencils, um, this time foregrounded rather than placed in the background. And pan-Arabism is a subject that would, have, um, that would have dominated what discourse was permitted in the state-owned media. Um, and the press was nationalized in Egypt in 1956, basically transformed into a tool for the regime. 
Now, I think it's actually quite important that we ask ourselves what Nasserist pan-Arabism, which would have been a ubiquitous topic as, um, as Shant was growing up in Cairo, I think we need to ask ourselves what that might have looked like to an Egyptian of non-Arab descent. Um, Pan-Arabism, I think, after all, is you know it's a project riddled with contradictions that are only at the time were only partially glossed by the anti-colonialist anti-colonialist rhetoric of independence. I mean, I think it's a it's a project whose overweening recourse to homogeneity actually rests on a flip side of exclusion. And I think it's probably a safe bet to assume that any response from somebody in Egypt whose only, who's only passport was Egyptian, whose only, who's only a bureaucratically is Egyptian, that is not an Arab, I suspect their response to pan-Arabism as espoused by Nasser would be, you know, to say the least, um, complicated. Um, and I think when you look at, if you look at Chant's best-known works, the Cairo stencils, which were all based on images that first appeared in the illustrated papers that proliferated in the years immediately before, and I think to a greater extent after the 52 revolution, revolution if you look at those images, um, a very, very complex, a very, very complex relationship emerges. Now, I'm going to show you um, just a handful of the stencils. I mean, there are more than 200 in the series. Um, this, is, um, this is Jamal of Dean Lafghani, um, one of the more controversial figures of the, um, the latter half of the 19th century, you know, a political adventurer, an anti-imperial campaigner, a religious modernizer, or a Sunni Muslim, or a Shia Muslim, or a double agent. Was he working for the Russians? Was he working for the British? What was he doing? A hardened opportunist. You can actually take your pick. I mean, there's no consensus about him. Um, this is um, Hindrustam, um, an actress whose fate it was to, um, to be dubbed the Egyptian Marilyn Monroe. Um, there's Fatim Hamama, who's um, who's actually in this exhibition. Um, you've already seen Gamal Abdel Nasser, um, a subject the artists depicted many, many times and often, often in the kinds of heroic pose that you most readily associate with, with socialist realism. But I think in the kind of great democracy of Chant stencils, Nasser actually shares equal weight with, um, with a female shop putter. This is a Beauty and Perfection, the title. Um, he, another nod in the image, in, towards the imagery, I think, of Soviet propaganda. He shares equal weight with political prisoners. This is uh, Shafiq Ibrahim Onsi. And, um, and with, um, this is a portrait of Cairo's most notorious pickpocket from the 1950s. Now, I think even such a brief selection from the stencils is enough to show the range of subjects. And I think you'd say, you know, there's certainly, um, there's certainly a motley bunch. And I think you have to ask, what do they have in common, these, um, these film stars and petty criminals, I mean, the president and, and all these divas? Now, the one, thing, the one thing the occupants of this pantheon share is that they were all depicted in the illustrated magazines and papers that proliferated in Egypt immediately before and after the revolution. And it's these depictions from the mid-50s onwards in, um, in papers that were state-owned and earlier in papers that magazines that were never less than partisan, it's these images that Avedisian uses as his source materials. So the Cairo, the Cairo stencils, they are images of images. I think. Um, here, here you can see a, a source, a, one of the, the sources, and then what Chant's done with it. They're images of images. And as, as Chant has, has noted, they can be endlessly reworked from the cutouts that he's made based on, um, 
on the pictures published in the magazines. I mean, in each reproduction, the backgrounds can be changed, new juxtapositions can be created. A single subject can be placed in multiple contexts. So, um, so here is Nasser with Che Guevara in a much larger panel, which is, which is simply titled Red. Um, here's um, a soldier. Um, the, Arabic, the Arabic title is, um, is um, Our Arab Forces. Um, he's charging, you know, with his Kalishnikov in hand across a background of, of live fire and, um, and a battlefield um, of silhouettes of other soldiers. Um, but he can be reused. He can also charge across a field of heraldic e eagles interspersed with the order No Photos in capitalized Latin script, which was, you know, once a ubiquitous instruction in in Egypt, in the vicinity of any government or military installation, and given the constant war footing on which the nation was placed as, um, as Chant was growing up, that meant anywhere and everywhere. Um, so they may be our forces, but we cannot take a snapshot of them. We're not allowed to reimagine them. But our Arab forces, as envisaged by, by Chant, and symbolized by this soldier, they can also be made to charge across a map of the Arab world. They can charge a, across a field of, fields of motifs drawn from 17th century Ottoman fabrics, um, architectural details culled from the length of the Silk Road, um, landscapes populated by the kind of um, hieratic figures that you find in Egyptian to ancient Egyptian tombs. Um, here's Nasser again. Um, and this, this, this uses the first stencil I showed, but it's now worked into, into a larger panel. And I think you can see in the, in, the, in the center of that central panel, that ubiquitous blanket band, no photo. Um, Chant's been very clear about what he sees as the advantages of his stenciling technique. Stenciling, um, he's, he's written, gave me the possibility of variation. Once the drawing was cut out, I could concentrate on color, on different backgrounds. But, you know, it's a process that also imposes formal qualities. So the schematizing of the figures, the paring down of all pictorial elements to areas of flat color, it actually turns the construction of a national identity pursued by the Egyptian re regime following the revolution of 1952, because that, I think, to a great extent, is what the big state-owned publishing houses were engaged in, um, alongside the Ministry of Culture, which, of course, until, until the 70s was the Ministry of Culture and National Guidance. Um, it turns that project into an essentially decorative enterprise. Um, I think Chant's simplifications, and they actually involve a real compression of narrative. And the subsequent emphasis on variation and the creation of new contexts by juxtaposition which I think ironically amplifies the pick and mix techniques of the propagandist. Um, it, oh, and the, the caption is, the caption of the original material is usually included, which also allows, you know, it then allows the inclusion of calligraphy, which is, you know, the most, one of the most privileged of Islamic art forms. It allows the inclusion of calligraphy in the, in the over, overall design. Um, on moving to these bigger panels, Sean has <coughs> said that they enabled me to assemble on one panel different subjects and thus tell a story. They, 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 these are all made on, the larger panels are all made on, on corrugated cardboard, which is sold as a packing item in, in the markets of Cairo. By this is a quote, by attaching the panels together, a whole space could be created. This gave me a large field of maneuver. The idea was also to replace the notion of one painting by a whole range of images 
that could be reused, replaced, interchanged, redesigned. Now, it seems to me that the, that the, the very process actually clearly negates the possibility that, um, that these stencils somehow, somehow articulate um, a nostalgia for a supposedly golden age. I think by reusing images produced as part and parcel of the project to police the parameters of identity, to promote, to, to promote a patriotism acceptable to the state and its approved narratives, the stencils actually undermine, and I think they do it with humor, and I think they do it with, with a certain irony, they actually undermine the foundations of that enterprise. In fact, I think they pull the carpet from beneath the Nasserist state's attempt to construct identity. And actually, I'd go, I'd go one step further, and I'd argue that the, the, the stencils actually express a very deep antipathy towards notions of the, the hegemonic um, whatever form they're going to take. Now, I think it's, um, I think it's nice that the show, the show here, here today, it happily includes pieces which pre and post date the stencils. Um, there are examples of the textile hangings, which, um, which Chant first exhibited in 1985. Um, there are photographs um, by, by the artist. Um, and there are, there, there, there are his, the, the, the most recent works of the kind of medium-sized panels in gouache on corrugated cardboard, which you'll see. Now, in, in describing his own work, Sean has frequently employed architectural simons, um, um, similes. Uh, my art master was the adobe brick, he has said. Um, putting three bricks together to make a wall, to make a pattern, that's magic. Um, architectural elements, and this is a stencil of the tuba, a, a simple mud brick, and they also form the subject of many, many pieces. Um, the artist has taken, I mean, Chant's taken many photographs of details, um, details of, um, of mosques and other buildings. These um, these are all glazed brick designs and brickwork patterns from, um, from Samarkand, but also um, from buildings in um, Egypt. This is, um, this is actually from Dakhla Oasis in the, in the Western Desert. It's a mud brick, mud brick wall. I think Chant's acknowledgement of the influence of the adobe brick and the process of building with this very basic unit, I mean, um, his, the, the influence of that on his own practice is actually a roundabout way of paying tribute to the influence on, on his work of, um, of the visionary Egyptian art, um, architect, Hassan Fatih. Um, in 1981, Shant actually began filing Fatih's papers and drawings, and it's an association that actually continued until Fatih's death in 1989. And I think Fatty, Hassan Fatih's purism, um, his insistence that genuine Egyptian art and the revival of crafts had to be tackled simultaneously, and I think his belief that the merging of ancient and modern art would succeed only if no external inference, interference in the, in the adoption of materials, techniques, or cultural assessments was allowed, um, that would have a major impact on Chant's work. The architectural conceits which Chant has continued to use in describing his own methods, actually, I think in much of the work produced during the 1980s, the period in which, um, in which he worked most closely with Fatty, I think that work can be seen in many ways as, as, as a homage, as Chant's homage to, to Hassan Fatty. Now, in 85, 1985, um, Chant held his first exhibition of textile hangings. Um, the works exhibited were the result of a pain, you'll see the, some of the textiles outside there, the result of a very painstaking process of assembly. 
the very basic unit, um, Chant's own tuba, his own, his own mud brick, were, and here I'm going to quote, the three basic shapes of the rectangle, square, and triangle from which, quote again, one is able to construct panels out of wood, paper, or any other material. And I think the results, the results often echo the stark geometries of Fatty's own buildings. Um, the source patterns are eclectic. They range from, um, they range from here's, um, this, is, this, this is a textile hanging based on the painted triangular decoration of an 18th century sarcophagi. Um, they range from, 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 from ancient tombs to, um, um, this is, um, to the polychromatic marble decorations of Mamluki mosques in Cairo. Um, but while, you know, I mean, ancient Egyptian sarcophagi, Mamluk tombs in, um, in, in uh, Mamluk mosques in, um, in Cairo. While some of the patterns are indigenous, the forms actually have a much wider, a much wider cultural resonance. And I'm going to quote again um, from something Chant's written. It was, in, it was in Western Rajasthan that I first came into contact with the world of applique, 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 applique textiles, which inspired me to make textile panels. Traveling by train through the Thar Desert, one arrives at this ancient city through which merchants passed as they crossed Iran from Africa along the caravan routes to India and China. The square, he goes on to write, is divided into rectangles and triangles, these squares placed together form the panels. Several assembled panels form the tent. It's a movable space, easily dissembled, easily folded and transported. Now I think kind of, you know, caravan routes um, to India and China, um, the Thar Desert, movable spaces, tents, um, they're all suggestive of the kinds of nomadic existence that the imposition of national borders has eradicated. I think in the appeal to, um, the, I think Chant's appeal to pre-modern models, I mean, it's at, once, it's at once deliberate, but it's also deliberately contrived because it's difficult, you know, it's difficult to believe that that anybody born in Cairo didn't first come into contact with appliqued panels actually in that city where there's an entire quarter given up to the making and where, you know, and where they form, you know, they're erected, the tents made out of them are erected in the streets and they're a very noticeable feature of the streets and, you know, celebratory and funeral tents. But I think, you know, that's not quite the point. I think the, the, the post-rational, I mean, his, 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 own, his own description of what informed, I mean, what informed his making of the textiles, um, is a post, it's a post-rationalization. It comes 20 years after, after he made, um, after he actually made the panels. And I think, you know, it's a very deliberate, it's a very deliberate construction because what it seeks to do is to delineate a cultural space where borders, um, borders are irrelevant. What it seeks to do is to posit a visual language that isn't actually constricted by those borders, by those boundaries. What it insists on is that you know, a triangle is a triangle in China and in Egypt and in France and that a square is a square. I think the same impulse is present in his account of the, um, the costumes he began to create beginning in 1987. Um, I'm going to quote from him again. Um, this is something he's written. And um, there is not much difference over a huge expanse of geography in the basic cuts of traditional costume. Much as in Silk Road architecture, Similarity is a constant feature. So I think, you know, from the Atlas Mountains to the Nile, from Morocco to Mongolia, 
Um, Sean basically has identified variations on a theme. Um, class boundaries, you know, they're, they're equally substantial. I'm going to quote again. The wealthier the individual, the higher their social status, the more expensive the material, but from the top to the bottom of society, the cut is the same. Now, I think kind of um, to note that reality actually differs from the idealized space that Sean is delineating is again to miss the point because all, all utopias involve wishful thinking. And a square, you know, a square may be a square, but not all squares are equal. And I think that's something that Sean knows better than, um, than most. I'm going to kind of do a little anecdote now. So, um, so to mark the centenary of Malievich's black square, um, the painting that you're probably all familiar with, to mark the centenary of Malievich's black square, the White Chapel in London staged an exhibition. It was called Adventures of the Black Square, Abstract Art and Society, 1915 to 2015. And it described the exhibition as follows. This is, this is their blurb, the Whitechapel Gallery's blurb. This epic show takes Malievich's radical painting, this epic show takes Malievich's radical painting of a black square, first shown in Russia 100 years ago, as the emblem of a new art and a new society. The exhibition features over 100 artists who took up its legacy, from Buenos Aires to Tehran, London to Berlin, New York to Tel Aviv, the paintings, photographs, and sculptures symbolize modernism's utopian aspirations and breakdowns. Now, Chant was one of the artists included in this show. So, however explicit he's actually been about the pre-modern origins of his own textile squares, they can still be, it doesn't, matter how, it doesn't matter how explicit he is, they can still be co-opted by an exhibition to celebrate abstract art and society between 1915 and 2015. They can be exhibited beneath the rubric that straitjackets them as symbolizing modernism's utopian aspirations and breakdowns. Now, I think that, you know, it was possibly as an attempt to escape such straitjacketing, straight um, to sidestep a discourse so hegemonic that it can shamelessly portray artisans in, central in a Central Asian market as taking up the legacy of Russian suprematism, that it can actually transform these artisans in a Central Asian market Without a blush, it can transform them into workers at the curl face of, um, of a European avant-garde. I think that um, I think that's to escape that. That's why his most recent panels, some of which are included in in this exhibition, in his most recent panels, Sean actually foregrounds the designs that once formed the backdrop of the Cairo stencils. So he. Um, he dispenses with, um, with figurative elements drawn from the pages of Egypt's national press, the better to focus attention on, I think, what's most, most often overlooked in, those, um, in the schema of those earlier works. Um, I think it's a reductionist ploy, but it's one that actually opens up hitherto concealed vistas and I think it's one that actually amplifies concerns that have long been central to, um, to his work. Um, the most recent panels um, illuminate, in, illuminate rather than conceal complexity. I think you, the juxtapositions are of abstracted forms um, drawn from designs on Bukhara kaftans. Um, from um, from the geometries of this this is the this is the floor of the mosque of Sultan Hassan, 14th century, in um, in Cairo. Um, this is the Sintamani, uh, it's an Ottoman design. On this is this is actually a a kaftan that was once worn by um, Sultan Murad the Fourth. 
Um, it's uh, the Sintamani is, is 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 not often embroidered in gold thread on velvet. Um, the panels themselves. Here's one of the panels. They're pad down. They're very elegant, and I think what they do is they kind of serve as milestones on a journey that follows. I think you can you you can see if you can remember the the earlier slide of the mosque interior and the polychromatic decorations on the wall. I think you can. You can, you can see the connection. Um, and I think what these latest panels do is that they, um, they're milestones on a journey that follows the Silk Road across the steppes of Central Asia. Um, the destination, if you kind of remember the glazed bricks um, before, this is, um, this, is, this is a panel based on the glazed brick designs. The destination is, um, is Samarkand. It's, um, which is both, you know, a fabled city and a real place. And I think it's that confluence, I think it's the intersection between story and fable, between the, the story fable and reality, you know, the city with its material culture. I think that is the confluence that Sean has always explored. What he's always done is he's juxtaposed privileged narrative, and I think you see that in the Cairo stencils, he juxtaposes privileged narrative <coughs> with unseemly fact. And I think Shant, you know, Shant takes the long view. And I think in examining this nexus of myth and reality, what he refuses to do is he refuses to allow hearsay to pose as history. He refuses to allow expediency to dress up as fate. I mean, the exotic is just, just happens to be one of the tropes, um, you know, that he repeatedly shoots down. Now, I think among the milestones on this journey um, along the Silk, Silk Road is, is this panel, which superimposes Ottoman Sintamani, um, as, as seen in the ceremonial robe, the, the fabric I showed earlier, um, it's a triangle of three spots and a pair of wavy bands. Here it's superimposed over, um, over repeated Bukhara floral designs taken from a kaftan. Now I think, um, I mean, there, there can't, there's nothing that can be neutral about an Armenian artist deploying Ottoman motifs. You know, it can't help but be a very loaded gesture. But I think, I think you know, one has to take on board that nothing in Chant's work is ever as simple as it seems. So the tiger stripes and spots of the Sintamani here, which you know, are a typical feature of, of Turkish textiles and ceramics they have been for centuries, they might appear quintessentially Ottoman, but actually the motif the motif predates Ottoman rule by several hundred years. It can be traced back, it can be traced back to the Buddhist period in China when the lines represented sanctity. Um, it was used by Tamerlane on coinage and to mark property. Um, the spots could allude to leopards, which um, the pelts of which were worn by heroes in the Persian tradition. Um, in China, the, the circles represented pearls. So I think if you take the long view, symbols cannot be reduced. They can't be reduced just as identities cannot be constructed at the whim of the state. And I think the very decept the deceptively simple decorative motifs Sean appropriates they actually re reverberate across vast spaces. I mean, and they echo, they echo in a space where boundaries are negated, where hegemonies cannot distort, and where identities need not be improvised. And that's, that's the space in which I think Sean, as an artist, has carved out a home. I think throughout his career, he's focused on a very, the, the works look very different, but throughout his career, he's focused on a single point. And that single point, I think, 
is a place where quite simply a square can simply be a square, can simply be a square. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Muchas gracias, eh, Nigel. Thank you very much, Nigel, for that. Uh, it's such an interesting presentation and your description there of the, the works uh, by Chanta. Now we can we can kick off a, a dialogue, uh, Sabrina and, and Nigel, about the work of Chanta and the artist. So I will speak in English. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. It's an amazing lecture. And myself, I learned so much. And I've seen so many works that I have never, I have never seen before by chance. Um, in fact, uh, to, to start this conversation, uh, I wanted to, to just share my own experience of uh, how I met with uh, Chant's work and then how I uh, met the, the artist. Uh, as uh, I was born in France and I live here since 10 years and the first time I, I saw Chant's works, of course they were uh, Cairo stencils um, and I was fascinated by them, by the technique and by all the glamour because I have to say it, that's what fascinated me, all these uh, famous uh, people that uh, you named uh, some actresses, uh, but I remember Farid al Atrash or Samia Gamal, uh, all the, the Egyptian but movie that I have there, watched at home with my parents since I was a kid. And, uh, and this fascinated me, and that's why I, I started to, to look at his work. And when I, when I start to look at his work as a professional, as a, as a gallerist, uh, I started to investigate and I discover the rest of this practice. And this is something you, you mentioned several times in, in your lecture. Um, you, you talked about what, how Chant, uh, as an artist, uh, or how Chant's work began to exist uh, through this um, uh, record uh, auction. Uh, in 2013, uh, though he was uh, and is. I mean, he'd been he'd been yeah he'd been working for decades before that. Yes. Um, and I mean, he's never he's never he's never actually had a large ex he's never had an exhibition in um, in Egypt, which I think is quite telling. And for the longest time, um, for the longest time, he wasn't perceived as an Egyptian artist. Um, he's Armenian. I mean, that's the way things work there. Um, he was very amused, I remember, um, when, the, um, when that auction happened, when, um, when suddenly there were newspapers rec newspaper reports, and he was Egyptian. And he wasn't just Egyptian, he'd broken records f for, for any living Arab artist. <laughs> you found that quite funny, because for the longest time he wasn't. An Egyptian. <laughs> or, I mean, in Egypt, you know, he says, in, in Egypt I'm Armenian. <coughs> Um, you know, in Europe, I'm Egyptian. In China, none of these things mean anything. Um, and he wants to be in a situation, I think, where none of those things mean anything. But those I, identities, those improvised identities. But this, this is something very important to me because when I, when I, I started to look at his work, uh, I was myself a, a victim, maybe, of my education in, in Europe. Um, or where I live, or where I work, and I, I really discovered what what I was, uh, the work I was seeing by Chant, which for me was uh, this nostalgia, uh, these movies. Uh, there was I discovered myself that I had a, misin a misinterpretation of a misunderstanding of his practice. And in fact, when when I started, and you show several images, and, and you will see in the show several pieces that are more uh, abstract about architecture, geometry, uh, which are, when it t took off the glamour uh, of it, you realize, and after your lecture, you really realize that chance work is much more political than it appears at first sight, or at least uh, as it has been seen it's during not, many it's, years. It's not nostalgia. <laughs> I mean, it's not that's, nostalgia, of that's, course. And, um, 
And what, what I mean, that, that there might be a nostalgic element in it and, and, and individual pieces could lend themselves to that kind of interpretation. But that's not what it's about, no, no. No, I, I mean, it is, I mean, it is. I mean, it's, it's an essentially political position that, in, that, 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 that he's, he was brought up in, in, in a very difficult period. He grew in, up in a very difficult period. In fact, this, this series of works started in the 90s which are in the, at the beginning of the the of Gulf the 90s, War, um, which is yeah, yeah. the Gulf War. Um, I, I interpret it, and not only me, but as a as a response uh, also to this context. And uh, you, this is something you you've been going through. And in fact, even in the chronology of in the exhibition uh, between the art events. Uh, in Chan's career, uh, there is also mention to political events or um, more not arty <coughs> events. Um, for me, so that, that is something also that we, we discussed uh, a lot and each time we, we discuss about art uh, with Chant, we always come back to politics. We always come back to history. And uh, in the end, there is a, a quote that I, I like to, uh, to share always with uh, <laughs> with the audience and uh, everybody wants to listen to it. Uh, Chant himself says that he, he doesn't do art, that he do fighting against uh, the influences. And uh, as, I, as I understand uh, Chant's work, it's, uh, you talked about how we want to simplify and how that's what he has been see, uh, seeking during uh, many years, to simplify, to minimalize uh, a certain language and to to create a simple language. Yes, I mean, I think, I th I, 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 I think formally, yes. But that, that, that's a formal process. But that also carries, that carries an enormous amount of weight. I mean, that, 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 that simplification of the, um, of the formal qualities, I think, actually, um, actually amplifies the complexity, the contextual complexity. Um, and I think that that's that's, and I th I, th I think the fact that he's dispensed with with these figurative elements and actually has foregrounded foregrounded what was in the background. I think that's that's very much that's very much a deliberate ploy to to avoid that being read as um, as a purveyor of nostalgia. And do you think I don't know if it's a, it's a very maybe. Um, uh, not simple question to answer, but um, do you think or, or uh, you live in Cairo since many years uh, now, and what you you know very well also uh, the the art scene? Uh, do you think there is this character characteristic, uh, or if there are characteristic that we can uh, put in evidence in the art production, more in general, in Cairo or in Egyptian artists, some um, characteristic or, um, uh, how to say it, uh, pra practices that, or, for, or languages uh, that we can not um, assi assimilate or that we can regroup under chant practice over the, the last 20 or 30 years. Um, I'm not. I'm not really sure what you're asking. Oh, sorry. Um, I think. I think. I think what's happened is that there is. Um, there are there, there 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 there's a generation of people who are now, who are now, playing quite constructively with with notions of identity. Um, I mean, I think. I think. I think. I think Chant's position, I think, you know, he is from a generation and he's from a background where he would much rather have dispensed with identity. Um, where he would have, where identity politics, he'd have much rather kind of not, not had those present. And I think a lot of his work, a lot of his work is, is an attempt to negate, negate that. Of course, I mean that it's an attempt to negate that, amplifies it as well. But he certainly, he certainly obviously didn't feel that he was in, in, a, in a position to begin playing with it. And I think, I think that's, to do with, um, that's to do with the particular time in which, in which, in which he was brought up. And the fact that he's, he, 
he made a very clear decision that he was he wasn't going to move to New York. He wasn't. He actually moved back. You know, he moved back to Cairo from Paris. He wasn't. He wasn't going to base himself in Paris. He wasn't going to base himself in New York. He was going to base himself in Egypt. So this is a reinvindication, in a way, or a reaffirmation, maybe, of where you come from, and that's I, that's something I. I, I have the sense to feel in his work, which is when he uses these uh, ancient uh, Egypt uh, symbols or the yeah, iconography. Yeah, I mean, I think I think I think that's that that's where the Hassan Fatih com comes in as well. There's this kind of insistence that there is there's, there's something very localized. There's something there there is something very substantial, but it's that very substantial thing that actually um, you know. An art establishment in Egypt, which is still, which is still, which is still caught up in those, you know, tradition um, versus modernity conflicts. Um, I mean, what Sean is delving in is stuff that, that actually the establishment isn't particularly interested in. You know, I mean, balladry is um, balladry can be become a word of insult in Egypt <laughs> when, the, when people want it to be. It could be a word, you know. Um, so I think, yeah, I mean, what he's, what he's interested in is, is and, and the recourse is, is often to pre-modern models. I mean, I think it might be to escape, to escape that, 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 that imposition, that, that imposition of identity, but also to escape that, that endless and, and unresolvable debate about tradition versus modernity, which, which goes on across the Arab world. I think, um, you know, I think, I think their strategies, I think Schott has developed all these strategies to kind of, to kind of escape, escape things that are being imposed. And I, think, um, and I think in doing that, he's created some extraordinarily beautiful art. Yeah, I, I <coughs> definitely agree with you. Um, you. We talked about also propaganda. Um, I mean, th that is a word that you, you mentioned, and it is very recurrent uh, in his work. And in fact, uh, about I wanted to, to add a few details about the, the pieces uh, uh, that we are showing at, uh, at Casa Kassara, at Arabe. Some of them, <coughs> they are stencils. Um, as, uh, as you mentioned, as the one that, uh, that we are viewing. Um, and uh, the large panels uh, and bands, you will see, uh, they are also made in cardboard. So this is, uh, on a way, the, something that he shared uh, with Hassan Fati, this idea of using not a poor material, but a simple, the simplest material No, the simplest possible. material, yes. I mean, and the, large, you know, the large panels are on corrugated cardboard. The, um, the smaller stencils of those very glamorous people, which are in the they're actually on... Um, Fine that, paper. No, they're actually <laughs> on the paper that, um, that butchers used to wrap meat in in Cairo. That is something I didn't know. They're all on kind of butcher's <laughs> paper. Um, but the, the fact that, uh, well, I wanted to, ma to mention that because um, I, I like to think about this paral parallelism uh, between uh, how Chant has been traveling throughout the years, how uh, in the end he, he found, uh, and he says that he just uh, found from China to, uh, to Egypt, uh, well, that's the title of the show, uh, uh, Levantine uh, Heading East, uh, how he found always the same uh, elemental uh, forms. And in, in a way, I like to do this parallelism with the cardboard that is something that you roll easily and oh, yes, transport yes, yes, easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in, uh, in the text and during um, the preparation of, uh, of this exhibition uh, with Casa Arabe, uh, and it's also the, the, the layout of uh, this exhibition to have something very tactical in which we will dis we invite people to, to discover what are the origins uh, before the Cairo stencils, before the architecture, before um, the panels and the, the iconography he uses, and the cardboard itself, uh, the fact that the layers, um, that the stencils, it's, uh, they are applied on multiple layers, 
And I like this metaphor to this complexity of identities, because in the end, uh, this is something I'm, I'm, I'm still dealing a question I, for me that is still unresolved, and even with my conversation with Chant, uh, after a year, we are still unresolved. I think, I, th I, th I, th I think when it comes to identity, it's possibly, um, it's possibly inevitable that these questions remain unresolved. <laughs> and I think it's kind of mining that, that, that mm -hmm. for which he kind of takes, I, mean, I don't expect any kind of resolution. <laughs> no, it, I, doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, I just share my frustration with you and the audience. Yes. Bueno, por razones de tiempo, eh, tenemos que ir cerrando para proceder a la inauguración de la, de la exposición. To, uh, si tienen alguna pregunta que hacer, brevemente. This talk because we have the opening of the show. Muchas gracias. Here, well, I would say thank you so much to our two speakers this evening and to you, uh, the audience, uh, for joining us. And we'll now open the exhibition, and you'll see just what a beautiful exhibition is. Thank you. Thank you.